Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Jersey Joe Corner. It is brought to you by Big Heads Media. It is going to be a great hockey season uh, coming right up. A lot of interesting things. Uh, Anchor.fm will help you uh, start your podcast and get things rolling. It's going to be a lot smoother when you uh, when you get the Anchor app, and it's so much easier to navigate. Even their online website at Anchor.fm is very efficient, and you can do a lot of great things with it. And I I stand by it myself. And I must say, it's time to say, let's go Devils. With the first pick overall, the New Jersey Devils are brought to select from the U.S. program, Jack Hughes. Well, good evening, everybody. This is the Jersey Joe Quarter Podcast, and this is your co-host, Jersey Jim. How's everybody doing this evening? Coming off a great two games for the New Jersey Devils. Two big victories. We're in the win column. Winless no more, as I like to say. I like to say we got four points to show for. Ain't that a beauty? And uh, I guess someone owes somebody a bet to be paid up on national television. Yes, he does. Jimmy Fallon will take a pie to the face from NJ Devil himself. And, of course, you're de- when you're dealing with a devil, you got to pay up. And how is that currency paid in? Pies. Shaving cream pie. And guess what Jimmy has to wear? His New York Rangers jersey. Boo, Rangers. (laughs) Hey, I mean, look, the devil called him out. He said, hey, you're going to take a pot of the face if we win? Jimmy Fallon obliged. Now he took a pot of the face. It'll be on national TV tonight. Got to stay up for that one. It's going to be a beauty. It's going to be a thing of beauty, really. I mean, Jimmy Fallon in his Rangers jersey. Getting a pie to the face, what could be better? I mean, here's the thing. You know, if, if it weren't for modern technology like YouTube and, you know, live streaming and recordings, uh, I don't think people around the world seeing Jimmy Fallon wearing a different kind of sport being ice hockey, you know, kind of it shows like the, the two rivals promote the sport on somewhere that's nationally televised. Yeah, I mean, look, this is great for, you know, the Devils, the Rangers, the Hudson River rivalry. Now it's getting taken to a a bigger stage, NBC. I mean, the game was on NBCSN on Thursday. Devils-Rangers, Hughes versus Kako. It was a great game. Uh, Devils come out, 5-2 victory. and uh, But now it's even on a bigger stage. you got Fallon involved, the Devils mascots involved. So you got to wonder what the next piece of this little bet's going to be when the Devils and Rangers play again. Oof. Well, it's uh, pork roll versus uh, New York cheesecake. That's my next guess. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do here. Maybe, you know, I got I got to imagine Fallon's going to oblige to have NJ Devil on a show again. Maybe whatever it is, dunk tank, um, maybe <laughs> another pie to the face. Who knows? Maybe Ken Danico comes out. He starts uh, trying to do the, uh, the 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 baseball to the uh, 
the little dunk contest. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be that would be absolutely fun to see. We all know Mr. Devil likes to get in on the action, especially if Ron Duguay is the one likes to be uh, jammed into the water. Yeah, oh, of course. And, I mean, look, NJ Devil is no uh, stranger to TV. I mean, just look at his ESPN commercials. When they ask him if he was going up and he just shakes his head and he's like, no. He's going down. He's going and, down. And and do, and do you remember the one over the summer? It's like, I think, June or July. And NJ Devil goes to the school. And all of a sudden, uh, people say, oh, you, you – you are going to break like a window or uh, like be careful when you break glass, you know, it might give you bad luck. Um, I think he broke some very big glass that they actually showed at the Prudential Center. Yeah, he did. Uh, He, he, I think that's why the devils had some bad luck to start the year is because he broke the glass window. So uh, (laughs) hopefully now our luck's turning around. I, I would hope so, and we got a lot more positive vibes going in this one. So anyone listening to this podcast, regardless of uh, where you are at this time, you know, it's 9.28 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in New Jersey, New York. Um, <clears throat> we are recording in the state of New Jersey, and Nico Heischer the other day got a seven-year extension. Let's talk about it. It is a Swiss delight, as I like to say. Seven more years of Nico. You know, it's a great deal. Seven years. He didn't go full on max eight years, but that's fine. But he's got a seven year deal at seven point two five million. So his total value of the contract is fifty million, fifty point seventy five million, fifty point seven five million for the entire length of the contract over seven years. So his first year, he'll get a $3 million base with a $4 million signing bonus. And after, and in, in the second year, it's $7.25 million AAV throughout the rest of the contract. And for those fans who are freaking out about it, please don't. It's cap friendly is out there. It's there to break it down. And, you know, new, and Nico Heischer is going to be paying New Jersey state taxes. He's going to be paying – you know, to live here long term. And, you know, we have Jack Hughes win that uh, three-year window of his entry-level contract. Once he gets into year three of four, you know, we know how much money to reallocate now with uh, Nico Heischer on the books. Yeah, I mean, this is a great deal. I mean, especially with the uh, cap going up. Um, we all know it's going to go up, and in three or four years, it's going to be it's going to be a great deal. I mean... You know, Heeshear is the number one center in the league. And, you know, he might not have the numbers, but soon he will. And he's coming off an injury, and he'll be back in the lineup against Arizona on Friday. But last year he was injured. So say he doesn't get injured last year, his projections, his numbers are even higher than what they were. So he's doing well. And if the coaching staff believes in him, He's going to be fine. This his contract is going to look great. His other comparables around the league, if you look at the other comparables, it's Clayton Cal- Keller in Arizona. It's, which we will see. Which we will see on Friday night. Um, and Kyle Connor, which they saw opening night in New Jersey. He scored. He scored. So those are pretty two good comparables around the league for Heashier. And we talk about, you know – how confident the coaching staff will be um, when it comes to replacing John Hines eventually. You know, we, we are going to need a coach that um, not only is a fiery, intense guy, but a guy who has the courage to play his top two lines more often than his uh, fourth line. I mean, you, you can't just, you know, play Jack Hughes um, less than six minutes like – I know the Devils won that game versus Vancouver. We'll get into that in a moment. But to me, that's a little alarming. Yeah, I mean, look, Hughes, he scored his first goal. And we'll get into that more because it was a great pass by Hall. But we'll break that down a little bit. But, you know, the coaching staff has – and Ray Shiro has looked at Heashier as a top center in the league. They, they believe that he's going to win a Selkie trophy. 
I could buy it. I mean, he's great defensively in his own zone, and if he continues to put the numbers up, I have no doubt once Patrice Bergeron retires that he could win a Selkie. Um, but, you know, Jack Hughes playing a little less than, you know, normal. You know, the Devils, you know, it was a tight game. And he was playing against his brother. So, you know, I could understand why the minutes were lower. But you got to roll your top two lines. And that's the one thing that, you know, we've been harping on over the cu- couple of weeks is your top players got to play top line minutes. That's the only way they're going to learn. It's the way that they got to immerse in these uh, new tactics and different strategies. And speaking of strategies, you know, I mentioned in one of my articles that, you know, before uh, Tommy Fitzgerald was uh, into the fold, um, I wanted to see more sticks in the lane. I wanted to see more shot blocking. And we finally started seeing that. And guess what? It's paying off dividends. In the near term, yeah, I mean, look, they blocked they blocked shots against the Rangers. They got in the way. The Devils got Andy Green back for the Vancouver game, and he blocked a ton of shots. I mean, look, that's the one thing he is good at is blocking shots, no doubt. Um, but again, in the Vancouver game, Mackenzie Blackwood stood on his head like he did in the Ranger game, especially on a power play. Um, he robbed Mika Zibanejad with the back of his skate, and then he robbed. Elias Pedersen, Bo Horvat, Brock Vesser, the list goes on. Quinn Hughes, Jack's uh, older brother, numerous times uh, Saturday in a one nothing <clears throat> shutout victory uh, for the Devils to make it two in a row. And so when we talk about these uh, young hockey players with really good genetics and all that, and, you know, we talked about this even before we started podcasting. Um, we talked about on our um, early day production about what kind of players that we like and what makes us think about these kids being likely drafted as a devil or any other team would select these players. Um, when we talked about Nico Heischer's comparables, um, when I first saw Nico uh, playing for Halifax and uh, the Swiss national team, what stood out to me was – um, he had a little bit of the smarts of a Sidney Crosby. His skating r- reminded me a lot of uh, Nicholas Backstrom. And his uh, two-way defensive game reminded me a lot of uh, my favorite non-devil of all time and Pavel Datsyuk. And Datsyuk is one of those guys who knew, even for a guy who was slightly undersized, he always had really good hands and he could strip a guy of a puck and he can make a really good counter attack and possibly put the puck in the back of your net. Yeah. I mean, those are great comparables um, for he when he was coming out, uh, especially that just the way, you know, he was a magician with the puck. And when I saw Nico uh, first play for team uh, Switzerland at the world juniors, I said to myself, this kid's going to be, a heck of a player in the NHL and you know, he's turning into that, you know, it's unfortunate that he got hurt um, against Florida with his ribs, but he's practiced and he said if he had felt okay and the doctors had cleared him, he would have played against Vancouver, but now he's got five more days off to get ready for Arizona, which we'll get into whether or not it's a good or bad thing for the Devils in regards to their momentum with the two wins and, you know, things they need to work on still. But, you know, Nico, you know, he's a great player. He's going to be a good – continue to be a great player. His numbers are already trending upward. And it's good to see that uh, Ray Shiro and the rest of the management staff can get this kid locked down. So that way the Devils don't have to go through an RFA situation similar to what Toronto went through last summer. With Mitch Marner, which was a huge debacle. I mean, you think how crazy it is with Taylor Hall as an upcoming UFA. Dealing with all that constant Mitch Marner, RFA, uh, talk all the summer. Even Paul Bissonnette uh, always talked about how crazy these contracts can be on spit and chicklets. And we... You know, as fans, you know, it, it can get out of hand. This is why 
most players don't want to stay in a Canadian market for the most part. Not necessarily because of taxes, it's because of the media is too tough for them mentally. But Mitch Marner's born and bred uh, Toronto Maple Leafs all over. And so is uh, John Tavares. But Tavares wanted to be a Maple Leaf even though um, he wanted to stay in Long Island, but it was too good to pass up being in uh, Toronto. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, Tavares goes home and it's the first time ever that a Toronto-born kid comes back to play for the Maple Leafs as a free agent. Most guys stay in their surroundings because they just don't want to deal with the media in Toronto. And speaking of out on Long Island, you know, the next guy, you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. It may not even Barzell. happen. Barzell. Yeah, exactly. Barzell's the next guy look for to get locked up. Um, he's put up, you know, it's funny. Everybody talks about Marner getting paid. You wonder how much Barzell's going to be asking for considering his numbers are right on par, if not a little better than what Marner has put up in his first three seasons in the NHL. Give a million dollars more. Yeah, so, you know, Lou Lamorello out there has some work to do. We know his history with signing long-term contracts, big money contracts for players. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does out there. And, you know, it's just good to have he sheer up seven more years. It's one player you don't have to worry about. And it kicks in next season. So, again, the cap will go up. And the Devils can figure out how they can manipulate for Hall um, and what other potential free agents are out there. And I would have to say is, like, we were talking about, like, imagine when PK hits his third year and if within those three years um, we get Riley Walsh from Harvard University into the AHL and maybe he doesn't need a whole lot of time in the AHL because – Kids like him, you know, they play on a similar skill set um, in the NCAA Division One, And they also, you know, matter of fact, Matthew Hellickson plays Division One for uh, the Notre Dame Irish, number five. They, uh, they won against Air Force. But back to my statement is that, you know, these kids that play the NCAA Division One level, they don't need – a whole lot of assimilation to the AHL. They can just um, get up to the NHL a little bit quicker than usual. Oh, yeah, and look look at it. Um, Kel McCarr out in Colorado, he, come, he came straight from college and went right into the <laughs> NHL playing for the Avalanche, and he's doing well this season as well for a team that's sitting in first place. So, I mean, the transition from the NCAA to the NHL – can happen quickly and then but sometimes you need the AHL to develop real quick so you know what Riley Walsh is definitely a guy you need to uh, keep your eye on and especially with the nine million dollars of PK Subban after that third year of his contract there's a lot of money that will be reallocated um, who knows if P- if not only PK stays and takes less money um, I believe the way um, he set up his social media accounts and he shows how much he really loves New Jersey. And even his uh, fiance, Lindsay Vaughn really likes it here too, especially, you know, being close to a lot of places where, you know, they're starting their, um, not just their lives together, but also their, uh, their charity work. Yeah. And, you know, it's good to have a guy like PK in, in the area, you know, he's doing good things and he just the fact that he's active on social media, so much is a great for the devils. I mean, that was one thing um, Jake Reynolds and uh, Hugh Weber talked about yesterday on Sirius XM with uh, the, on the hot stove with Dave Pagnota, uh, Dave McCarthy and Dennis Bernstein who were at the game. Uh, Pagnota and Bernstein were doing live from the game uh, yesterday. So it was good to hear that the devils are loving the fact that PK's on social media the devils are doing trying to do more things on social media and you know that's that's good to get their name out there because you know one of the things the devils have prided themselves on over the last several years has been the fact that ticket sales are up people are coming and they're building a team and people are coming to the games and over the years before nico heischer was around and 
it was only Taylor Hall and a bunch of other players, not named Martin Bordeaux, you know. Uh, the arena was filled up to 80% capacity. Nowadays, it feels above that 80% mark, maybe 85, 90 on most nights, if not close to 100%. It, to me, it feels a lot better. Like, there's an energy nowadays. Now we talk about this two-game win streak now. You know, it's only going to help get people in the building more and, you know, all these new uh, – Things like game time, you know, where you get your tickets from Ticketmaster from resellers or people that can't make it, you know, it's getting them into the seats a lot easier. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, the Devils, they do, they're doing well, especially with these afternoon games and the rivalry games will always bring the fans out. That's what you want. That's the key right there. But, you know, the team is winning. They're trending in the right direction. They've got two wins on the board, and that helps. Winning always helps. And it doesn't matter what you do personnel-wise. The fact that there's so much excitement around this team this year, maybe it took them some time to get going. But And having Fitzgerald back there is great, too. I mean, that extra set of eyes, what he's done defensively in just the two games is they've, they look just – there's more structure inside that team. And I really like that. And the fans, they're coming out. They keep talking on social media. They're emailing me. They're texting me. They're asking me, hey, what do I think <laughs> about this? You know, I'm like, look, guys, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that the team is doing well because it makes things more exciting. And, and, it makes, it, and it makes it fun for the fans when they come out. You have a great conversation. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? It, and it makes the positive energy around the building is so good. And you know what? After the first six, you know, bad losses, um, it was hard for me to fathom, you know, losing more. I mean, I felt like my, my heart was being gutted out and just it felt, you know, pretty like you almost lost a soul. Like that's still inside your stomach. You know what I mean? Like right up there in your chest. But after that first win against the Rangers, like it started coming back, kind of like in um, the movie Elf, where the 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 Santa belief meter goes up for the Christmas spirit, holiday spirit meter. Yeah, and the um, and the sleigh starts flying. Well, that's how my heart is feeling. It's starting to feel a lot better and more perkier on that on that on those two big wins. Yeah, I mean, look, the, you know. There's like the negativity meter and everybody, and now it's it's shifting towards the middle. People are believing again, and they're showing why they're a playoff team. And as we talked about at the beginning of the year, Mackenzie Blackwood, this guy is the future. This guy is the starter. Um, Dave Bastel, and I was on Saga Nine Sixty. He asked me about you know what do I thought about Mackenzie Blackwood stealing the net. I I pegged Blackwood as the starter from the beginning of the year. And, you know, obviously the first game he comes in, you know, he's cold. So, you know, it's tough. And then they go up to Buffalo on a back-to-back and that momentum thing. But he played well against Boston. Even in a loss, he kept them in the game. And then he played – he plays really well against the Rangers. And he shuts out Vancouver. And you can't ask for more from that. And that's I'm, what he's doing. I mean, you, you look at Vancouver, you know, Brock Besser is supposed to be one of the best snipers in the game. He's one of the young ones out of University of Minnesota from the Gophers. And so for people who have followed him, he's got one of the best snapshots, if not the best slap shot in the game uh, for a young guy his age. And being able to shut down the Canucks, I mean, sure they don't have a bunch of really young guys that are really talented. I mean, they do have Bo Horvat, but, I mean, they still have really good skill. It's just – you know, things could have been really negative if they came out clicking in synchronization against Blackwood. Yeah, I mean, look, their their power play didn't click yesterday, you know, with Pedersen on there, with Horvat, um, Besser, Quinn Hughes. I mean, the list goes on. And then they got, you know, their bottom six guys with Jay Beagle and <clears throat> Michael Furlan. And and we for, I forget to mention JT Miller, who – Played a hell they of traded. A, yeah, they, they traded, traded for, for the draft. Yep, exactly. And then Jake Furtanen's there, Brandon Sutter, and then on the back end, Alexander Edler. 
So and then they signed Tyler Myers in the offseason from Winnipeg. So they have a lot of depth and not to mention not to mention in goal, you know, Thatcher Demko who from Team USA. Team USA who played a great game yesterday and he said, you know, on the Hughes goal, he's like, "Look, I was seeing what Taylor Hall was trying to do with the puck." And he loses him, and he sends it over to Hall, and he's like, "Look, he sends it over to Hughes, and he's like, he just put it where a place where I couldn't get it." So, and it was a great goalie battle yesterday between Blackwood and Demko after the one nothing goal. I mean, I've watched Thatcher Demko play for Team USA. Sure, they fell short a few times, but I believe they did beat uh, Team Canada with uh, Troy Terry um, in the in the gold medal, if I'm correct. If I remember correctly, that was him. Yes, I believe Demko was in net for that. Actually, yeah. But I remember it was in watching, Montreal. Yeah, Montreal game. That was, a, that was a hell of a game. That was a great game. And guess what? That, that building is hosting the upcoming draft. And um, who, who better is to segue uh, in this upcoming Canadian from uh, Quebec and the Ramouski uh, – Oceanic uh, is uh, Alexi Lafreniere. Um, this name will be thrown out a lot on this podcast because um, he is supposed to be the census first overall pick. Um, he's a left wing center, um, plays for Team Canada. So you're going to hear about him a lot and might be playing um, with the under 20s with uh, Ty Smith. Yeah, he's, uh, he, you know, Lafreniere is a great player. Um, he, I think he's going to go number one. Um, but then again, things could change. I mean, it's only October. So, you know, we, we have seen that, you know, if somebody has a good World Junior tournament and has a good second half of the season, all of a sudden they could be the number one guy. So uh, he's going to be a great player. And he's going to be one of the guys you're going to want to watch when uh, the Russian uh, junior team comes over and plays in their uh, series with, against the uh, against the OHL, the QM, and the WHL. And, of course, for our uh, Devils fans across the globe and here in New Jersey, um, we have so many prospects across the uh, CHL, um, whether it's Nikita Ohotyuk from uh, the Ottawa 67s from Russia. You have Graham Clark, who's Canadian. Um then you have Mitchell Holscher, who's with the 60s. Oh, there's a good chance you might be seeing these kids um, playing for those teams. And you have uh, Case McCarthy for Team USA. Um, not in the OHL, but, you know, going off to college pretty soon. And you have a lot of these kids um, that aren't going to – they're going to show up, you know, for their country when they do get invited. Yeah, so going back to Demko real quick. So he was actually on the um, 14 World Junior Team and the 15 World Junior Team as well. So he wasn't on a 17 team. That was Tyler Parsons that backstopped Ah. that gold medal team. But he was on Team USA at the World Juniors, but he's played with a lot of guys. Um, But, yeah, he's a heck of a goalie. But you're going to definitely want to keep your eye on uh, on the upcoming – you know, week long uh, showcase of the Canadian juniors and the Russian juniors because that's just going to be that's always fun hockey to watch because and you got to thank NHL Network for simulcasting the feed from Sportsnet because they do a great job with junior hockey. And uh, one of my favorite uh, idols of all time is listen to Craig Button, and to me, he does a great job not only calling the games but also analyzing each player individually and talking about their skill sets. And that's why I learned about um, the lingo and all the good stuff. You know, um, every year I see some of those tournaments that are based on TV or even recorded. That's where I take my notes on each player. And I begin thinking, okay, I like this kid. Maybe not, but this kid might be a steal in one of those rounds. So um, sometime we're going to have to get on, um, you know, the draft analyst on here uh, from the sporting news. Yes, we should. Yeah, definitely. When the draft gets a little closer, um, we're definitely going to have a draft analyst on here. He's going to go over our rankings from previous years and our rankings for this year. And, you know, we'll get into that as 
the draft comes As, along. But for the time being, we're going to get back to the way the Devils have been winning and how the structure is playing out. And right now we want to talk more about how coaching has been key. You know, we saw how uh, undisciplined the Rangers were in that first win. And you saw how they took those really – crazy penalties you know even after the devils you know did a penalty of their own the rangers added a couple more yeah i mean look the um rangers were definitely undisciplined um the devils took advantage of it uh palmary on that power play goal over uh alexander gorgiev um that was a heck of a shot from him um but the devils as, as tyler kelly said on our wednesday show last week he said the rangers were the perfect team for the Devils to play analytically wise because they had a, a worse Corsi than the Devils did defensively. So that's good. And the Rangers are your young team, and you and you saw it today. I watched uh, Vancouver play. Uh, yes, uh, the Rangers. I saw that on YouTube. Yeah, they. I mean, they just were all over the Rangers like the Devils were. And you know, the thing is, the Devils neutralized the Rangers' top line. They made other guys beat them, which is the strategy going in. And Fitzgerald knew that. And when you take Mika's advantage ad away and you take uh, Artemi Kako away. Kako away and you take Artemi Panarin away and Kreider away, you got to meet those other guys beat you. And the Rangers just didn't have the depth, unlike the Devils who got depth scoring that night. And I will have to tell the listeners who didn't watch that Devil-Ranger game, um, one of my key turning points in that game was uh, the turnover – that Nikita Goose have uh, capitalized on, and he took it from his own countryman in uh, Artemi Panarin, who usually gives the Devils a lot of fits, um, usually with uh, the Blue Jackets and the Blackhawks. Uh, he, in this case, uh, cashed in big time going five-hole once again on another goaltender. How many times is he going to do it? I mean, he's a true Red Army sniper. He really is a Red Army sniper. I mean... That was a great execution of, you know, just not giving Panarin time and space, lifting a stick, grabbing a puck, and then just firing a shot because Gorgiev wasn't expecting it. He didn't think it. He didn't think that he would have to see a shot there because Panarin would just get it out of the zone. And of course, um, over the summer, Tyler Kelly, who we had on last, um, he was the Gusev whisperer. He advocated statistically and analytically for Gusev on Pucks and Pitchforks all um, off season. And until things were getting closer, as I was finishing up my vacation in Europe, I got you know, notifications on Instagram, uh, not Instagram, but on YouTube. Then I went to Instagram and saw both official Devils accounts saying that they officially got Gusev. And I saw the, the Gusev uh, stuff. And I was like, holy crow, this guy is amazing. Because I saw him score against Germany and a few other countries uh, in from Pyeongchang on TV in Korea. Yeah, I mean, he had a, he had a great uh, Olympics uh and he also had a, he's had a heck of a couple of world championships too. He was one of the great players for Team Russia, and it's good that the Devils have him. I mean, his ice time, you know, yesterday was down some. Again, they're gonna have to. That's one of the things Fitzgerald is gonna work on. They're gonna work on this week with the five days off now before Arizona shows up. Uh, you get him to a little bit more better defensively in his own zone. Um, that's just one of the keys he's just got to work on. He's just not used to playing defense. Back checking. Yeah, back checking. I mean, you, you saw that. It's a lot of guys that come over from Russia. They can't back check. Um, but he's got a heck of a shot, and when he uses it, it goes in the net. And I remember when I was at the game versus Edmonton, I saw him step into a slap shot big time, and I could actually hear it from upstairs. I was actually uh, – Blake Coleman's distant cousin was actually – uh, in my row, we were talking, and uh, I just couldn't believe how amazing that that goal sounded from way up top in uh, the 200s. Yeah, I mean, look, the, all, the, the goals he scored this year have been absolute snipes, um, and that's what the Devils got him for. I mean, they're, they're paying him two years, uh, $4.5 million, which is very reasonable, 
Um, so he's just got to clean up some things here and there. But don't, I wouldn't be surprised by in a couple of games or so that the Devils get the lines that they want and the top two lines have like Hughes and Gustav playing with each other. And we definitely will see some, you know, shaking of the uh, cocktail once uh, Nico Heischer comes back because, you know, I do see Jack Hughes for the time being staying on the first line with Taylor Hall. And those two, to me, always connect. And if they can stay doing that for the rest of the season and the team keeps on winning, you know, we won't even have to hear about those terrible things from sportsnet.ca saying, oh, um, by the way, looks like the things in New Jersey with Taylor Hall is uh, he's going to leave on July 1st. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a long way away. It's a process. Um, the quote, the Hugh Weber and Dave Blitzer with their 76ers, you got to just trust the process as much as the saying is been put into the ground. It's a long process. Um, Shiro said it yesterday. He says he's not, they're not going through the media to, to have this negotiation. There's no new update. They've been talking. He's been talking with his agent. He's been talking with Hall constantly. So it's not going to happen overnight. It may not happen this season. It could happen towards the end of the year. could happen in the summer. We don't know. They're not going to negotiate through the media. And it's too early for people to wonder what the Devils are going to do with Hall. It's just too early. If this was near coming near the trade deadline, then I say, okay, we got to figure out what they want to do. But right now, let's just pump the brakes a little bit on that. Exactly. People will always put things into overdrive regardless. And when we think about different – uh, things going forward, we have a lot of prospects that are, you know, awaiting their turn in uh, Binghamton. We have, you know, Nathan Bastion, who's had his cup of coffee. We have Michael McLeod, who's beginning to learn how to shoot more and become more of a uh, dirty area forward like he did in Mississauga, but starting to transition at the AHL level. Um, we have Mikhail Malsev, who's from Russia, who's starting to get his feet wet um, in the North American game, and he's proved a little bit in the preseason. Yeah, I mean, I like you know Albany's playing well, and and th- think about it, Albany, Albany, Albany. Albany think uh, once about again, it. once again, <laughs> Binghamton. It, yes, it's Binghamton. But I, I'm so used to. It. With that, for years I had the River Rats on my mind. Yeah. It was great. So down, down <laughs> in Binghamton, shirt. down in Binghamton, it's great to see McLeod and Bastion turning uh, into good prospects because there was a lot, a lot of people who wondered when would their time be, and they finally put a good training camp together. And you know, you get, not to mention, and then look on the back end. You got, don't forget, the Devils have Joe Morrow down there that they signed. Um, they have Joey Anderson down there. Blake Spears is down there. Fabian Zetterlund is down there. Not to mention, Student Nietzsche. Yeah, Student Nietzsche is down there. Now, here's an interesting fact is the fact that, you know, Jesper Boquist hasn't gotten into the lineup a lot. There is an option since he's played over in Sweden in the pro league and he's 18, they can send him to Albany to play because there's something in his contract. So if they send him down there, it can slide to the next year, his ECL. So they could bring up like a Bastion or a McLeod to fill that role where they could go in and out of the lineup. So there's a way of wiggling around contractually. So that's a good thing because then he can get some games. And um, when, John Hayden begins screwing up, you know, you'll you'll see something going in the middle of the season. But, you know, uh, as we've seen John Hines, he's, he's pretty fourth-line heavy. Yes, he is. He's very fourth-line heavy, especially towards end of games. Um, but you want your defensive lines out there towards the end protecting the league. You don't want your guys that don't play defense that well um, protecting the league. And that's one thing Don Cherry has always um, – said on Coach's Corner on Hockey Night Canada that he's like, he wants those guys out there. You don't need to have the scorers out there. You just need the guys that know how to play defense the right way and get the puck out of the zone. 
And he was also uh, bashing on Coach's Corner, which he had Alex Petrangelo put a, a terrible pass the other night, and they got hemmed into their own zone, and they end up getting scored on. And so it's one of those things that uh, St. Louis has been getting hammered uh, as of late from the Stanley Cup hangover. You know, it's not always daisies and rosies, even after you win a cup. Yeah, I mean, look, St. Louis will find a way to turn things around. I mean, it's so early in the season um, for them. Uh, they're still one of the teams that are going to make the playoffs. But it's different when a team is gunning for you. And that's what got the Devils going for a team like Vancouver. You know, Vancouver, you know, was one of those teams like New Jersey that didn't make the playoffs. But once they got, you know, someone really good in uh, Elias Patterson going for the next season, you know, it kind of gets them going in the right direction with the players that they still had from the year before and added to. And so um, for a team that took on a, a lot of skilled and deaf players and talent, um, it shows a lot of character of this New Jersey roster um, with the right uh, coaching structure. Yeah, and look, you finally saw the Devils put up a fight and protect their teammates in the Vancouver game. It starts in the Ranger game because it's a rivalry. You don't want to get, you know, hit around. You want to bash the body here and there. But when Alexander Edler hit Blake Coleman yesterday, oh, boy. Everybody, the dog piles Mueller, start. Mueller got into it. Yeah. So it was good to see guys stepping up for each other. Um, but there was no, you know, supplemental discipline for Edler. I mean, um, it, you could see – Lately, um, the NHL, you know, especially with the Taylor Hall hit on Adam Fox and the Edler hit on Coleman, it looks like they're looking at, you know, what the player is doing, putting himself in a vulnerable position to get hit towards his head. So no discipline for Edler, but it was good to see that the devil stepped up and played, you know, hard against a, a Vancouver team that had won four games in a row. And also, like, we talk about Arizona, like, I was just watching a few highlights, and it shows that Oliver Ekman Larson is pretty active from a defender standpoint, you know, becoming more of a two way player. And he's one of those guys you can't allow to get open because he plays like a fourth forward. Yeah. And, you know, the Coyotes are playing well. They played one, they won a game, won again last night, their third in a row. Um, they're hitting the road. They're coming through the East Coast. They're going to hit the Rangers, the Islanders, and then they play the Devils. Um, guys, you got to watch out for, obviously, Clayton Keller. But Nick Schmoltz is playing really, really well for uh, the Coyotes this year. And not to mention, you know, Phil, Phil Kessel. Kessel. Yeah, I mean, he's only got two goals on a season, but he could break out any time. And he usually does against the Devils. Because he's so used to playing for good old Pittsburgh and, you know, uh, there's always that familiarity of that player style. And and if you play against that coach for so long, you know, you, it comes easier for you to figure out over time. Yeah. And, you know, again, Kessel's dangerous. They have caught Carl Soderbergs there, Derek Stepan, you know, as you mentioned, Oliver ekman Larson. Um, so they got a lot of good talent on that team. Um, it's going to be a tough game. I mean, you see – what happens when they roll through Jersey after playing in Long Island and then playing in Madison Square Garden? But it's going to be a one. It's going to be a fun game. Two young teams going up against each other. It's just going to be one of those games that you're going to have to watch. You know, Darcy Kemper's playing well for the Coyotes, and obviously Antti Grant is there, and uh, Eric Comrie also. So you know, they're the Coyotes got a good team. Um, Devils seem to struggle sometimes with the Coyotes. Uh, but I, I could see them. I could see them winning that game and and turning their two in a row into a winning streak. And you know what? That sounds like something we were talking about Major League Two with the coach. He goes, "Guys, you win one, that's a win. You you get a win tomorrow, that's called a win streak." Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, good old Lou Brown from Major League Two. Gotta love that movie. You know, he's like, "Yo, we won a game yesterday." We won one today. That's two in a row. We won one tomorrow. It's called a winning streak. So they won their game against the Rangers. They won against Vancouver. 
Now they're going to have to win against the Coyotes. And with a couple of, with five days off, you can work on that power play. You can keep working on that penalty kill. Keep, you can Fitzgerald can start closing the gaps on the defensive side of things. And you know they're going to have to they're going to be in tight for uh, for the Coyotes. I can listen to a reference from Major League and hear when Jack Hughes gets a nice little takeaway and he scores, and I want to hear. Uh, Ray Shear go, way to go, Jack. I got Wait, him. I got him. <laughs> Such a great movie. Such a great movie. They actually, they actually should put that, uh, they should actually put that on the Tron in, in the Prudential Center. Say, way to go, Jack. <laughs> you know what? That was, that was my, that was my go to, like, uh, line. Every time Jack scored for Team USA and when uh, Jack got drafted, you know, that, that was like my punchline. I wish there was a GIF uh, on Twitter because uh, I think a lot of people would get that reference, especially an old, like, 80s, 90s movie that's still a classic today. I, I would imagine that it's got to be on Twitter. I mean, everything's on Twitter, so... I mean, the New Jersey Devils should be listening in on this podcast because they know that we love seeing these wonderful things. Uh, matter of fact, I know the gal that does the design, Emma Carroll. I know you'll do a fantastic job adding that along with the Ric Flair. We already know you did the woo. Exactly. That would be great to have Chiro, like, just say, way to go, Jack, and, and uh, just have that on the Tron. Yeah, that would be so good. And uh, speaking of good ideas, you know, there's there's a lot of different theme nights through through the rest of this season. And, you know, it would be a good theme to see the Devils, you know, do something pretty scary for uh, Halloween. Yeah, didn't it? I you know usually I remember uh, a couple of years ago they had a Halloween theme night usually. Uh, but you know, if that's if they were if they were home, and I mean, they played the night before Halloween this year, so against the Tampa Bay Lightning, so you never know what they're gonna do uh, the night before Halloween. You know, maybe there'll be some scary, you know, tricks and treats that go on throughout the arena. Maybe there will be some sort of candy giveaway. You never know; there might be a partner of uh, the uh, the businesses that might end up giving out certain amounts of candy to uh, to the first maybe uh, 18,000 fans. Yeah, that would that would be awesome. You know, what's going to be uh, – you know, what's going to be a popular item? Uh, it's going to be Friday against the uh, – against the Chicago Blackhawks. It's uh, the Jack Hughes uh, Star Wars bobblehead Jedi night. <laughs> And you know what they should have is Jack, Jesper Bokvist playing against his brother Adam Bokvist in that game because you want to see defender versus forward just like uh, Jack versus Quinn. That was oh, that was phenomenal yesterday. That was great hockey on Saturday between the Hughes brothers. Um, they played great against each other. It was a fun game. Uh, just two great players. And you saw Jack and, and uh, Quinn go – to go heads up one on one against each other numerous times in the game, and he he could have easily burnt his brother Quinn. I remember him saying on that um, that thing with NBA, NBCSN, uh, you know, hockey. Uh, it was like a mini documentary, and he goes, "I usually score sixty percent of the time out of the many times I play my brother," <laughs> and and he's, he has such a grimness of a smile. Yeah, I, mean, I like that about him. He, he's got that like, I I'm just naturally cocky. I don't need to be extra cocky. No, yeah, I mean these two guys have a rivalry going back to since the day they were born, and it's just fun to see these two kids play in the league. Two and up, you know, pairs of brothers playing against each other, and uh, there's another one on the way. There's another Luke. Yeah, Luke. Uh, Hughes is on his way too, so they could have all three of them could be in the league, and they could all be playing against each other. And there's going to be a lot of time off for those two parents. And matter of fact, um, if you saw, if anyone saw the Devils Canucks Twitter 
uh, accounts, they actually showed the big photo of Jack Hughes's family uh, that was there at the game. Yeah, they uh, all had custom T-shirts made with both logos on it, and it had uh, Hughes on the back. And Mom was really happy when uh, Jack scored his first goal uh, against the Canucks. I remember one of the games, I believe it was the Devils-Ranger game, um, at one point, NBCSN queued in and they showed that um, Jack Hughes's mother sat a, like one row up and uh, Jack scored on the assist of uh, Miles Wood. Yeah, you know, it's funny because initially I thought Hughes got his first goal against the Rangers, which would have been amazing. Uh, but the fact that he got it against his brother – It'll be uh, he he's one up his brother for Thanksgiving at least. <laughs> well, there's definitely a lot of bragging going on at that Thanksgiving table. I mean, you you got November being the month of American Thanksgiving, and we all talk about a team progressing in the right direction for the playoff push. And of course, there's there's one of those two teams, and who knows. You know, the Devils go on a nice run and they can keep it going through the rest of the new year. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got you got two games in two in the win column. Forget about the first six. You're two and oh as of right now. And that's what Brad Gilbert used to always say. You know, he's one of the tennis guys I listen to on ESPN. And and he talks about, you know, guys having losing streaks against top players. But once they get that first victory, Against them, they're like, look, forget the past. As of right now, you're one and zero against them. So you got to look at it this way. Yeah, forget the first six games. You just won two games. You're two and zero right now. The season starts now. Get focused and keep playing devil's hockey. And we want to see, you know, the defense start to grow together, start to mesh. And when I was queuing in on the Devils versus Rangers game, I saw PK Subban start to become himself again i mean there were times where he could have you know destroyed the the goal net with his slap shots yeah and the devils are getting them open and the thing is they're learning to play with each other and they're learning to play with Subban and what he likes to do i mean he's all over the place so you know but he's getting in position to shoot the puck they all are they're all shooting the puck more which is good and i think that's one of the things for sterile is harped on them they're just they weren't shooting enough on net, they were trying to make a pretty pass for the goal. Just shoot the puck. I I always say you know less than three passes is is perfect because the that third should be your shot. I mean, you know that three strikes you're out. That should be the third strike is the one you you swing at. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look once you hit that slot area, the puck should be going on net, and. <laughs> And that's what they've been doing. I mean, PK, you know, he missed a bunch yesterday on a power play, but he's he's looking to bomb that shot on a power play, which is good. And they've tweaked a couple of things on that power play, which has opened up more lanes. They're not all bunched up anymore, which is good. I always say, you know, on a when you have, you know, your two defenders above the blue line, or as they call it, low danger, it's good to have them spread out along that area and you get your – other three guys up and close to mid and low danger. And we've seen Jack Hughes score from mid danger uh, when he's gotten that other pass from right across the other side from Taylor Hall. Yeah. And, and Taylor Hall's pass uh, in the Vancouver game was a great pass and no look right across the, right across the slot area. Hughes then roofs it upstairs. And, you know, it was a great shot, great pass. Kids don't always look to go behind the back or no look a pass. It's not a good thing. But when you can it's get not a, cool. It, yeah, but when, you can, but when you can get away with it and make it – when you're a star player like Taylor Hall, it, it works. And he fooled so many people on Vancouver and that with, left Hughes wide open. And, you know, it was a great shot, great pass. And now he's in. The, now he's on the board. He's got two points in his last two games, and now he's going to have more confidence. And one of the things I talked about, you know, from the art of war, you know, 
you always want to be able to deceive your uh, your enemy, and Taylor Hall and Jack Hughes were able to do that, and also um, the Devils in the neutral zone versus the Rangers against against them in the neutral zone. You know, PK got I believe it was PK. Correct me if I'm wrong. They, they had the, the defender uh, pass it to Coleman, uh, who stripped the puck, and Coleman. I went along the boards and he did a nice little power move for a little bit. And not only did he protect the puck, but he also shot the puck right on uh, the mask of uh, Alexander Georgiev. And it went right into the, his five hole and it went, it went for a beautiful goal on national television. Yeah. I mean, Subban had that empty netter to ice the game. Um, it was, it was great. I'm, you know, I texted my buddy who's a Ranger fan, and I said, "Up, oh, I guess we're finally off the out of the win, out of the uh, loser circle now." He's like, "Ha ha!" And you know, a lot of people usually are, you know, harping against the Devils to not win. You know, like the other Ranger fans start, you know, silencing. Like it, it felt good to hear certain people not harp you down because, like, like oh, whatever. They look at you like, like you coming in with that swag. It's like you're not saying it, but you're feeling it. Yeah, I mean it. You know the Devils. You know they got up for their game against against the uh, against the Rangers, and they played really, really well. And then they carried that momentum into Vancouver. And like I said, <clears throat> there's still some things that they can work on, but the the things that they they did work on with. Um, Tom Fitzgerald before the Ranger game and going into the Vancouver game, you could see the massive improvements and they, they could, they have five days off, which, you know, some people would say, Oh, it's going to kill the momentum, you know, on, on to the contrary, because now they have more time to work on things to get even better. Because there's always room to improve on those nooks and crannies. I mean, whether you're the, best NHL player in the world or you're just becoming, you know, a, a first time, you know, hockey player, you know, at a young age, you know, you're going to learn to um, start defending your own zone. And then you're going to learn how to kill uh, power plays. You're going to kill five on fives, four on fives, other kinds of odd man uh, opportunities. And maybe you can turn those odd man opportunities into shorthanded goal opportunities exactly excuse me here um exactly and you know what they're gonna do is they're definitely gonna be more a little bit more aggressive on the pk um the power play you know it's funny because you don't need to rely on blackwood to have a shutout yesterday he probably would have still got it but imagine if they could have pumped in one or two power play goals um before. He wouldn't have to be all out of his uh, mind on that one. Exactly. So, you know, that's the definitely an area they're going to work on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they keep trying to tweak the PK a little bit, even though it has been better. Um, but, you know, again, little things here and there make it a better hockey club. Um, closing gaps defensively, they're definitely going to have to do that. And... and uh- and you and you were gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, when you have good uh, defensive zone structure, it gives you a better breakout, and you could, which leads to more scoring opportunities. And just again, limit the team's time and space, like Gustav did on a fourth Devils goal against the Rangers, and you'll be good. And it kind of reminds me, like last year, you know, Tor- the Toronto Maple Leafs were one of those teams, you know. They were really good, you know, being shorthanded, you know, getting guys like William Nylander uh, to be open. You had Mitch Marner, you know, all have their chances, you know, especially when John Tavares, you know, doesn't exactly get those opportunities because he's usually the one driving the play. But, you know, you looked at the 2017-2018 Devils, um, Brian Gibbons and – uh, Blake Coleman were the guys in the secret sauce in the on the shorthanded opportunities that really turned other teams' power plays into uh, miscalculations. 
Yeah, and speaking of Brian Boyle, uh, he is back in the National Hockey League. He signed a one-year deal, nine hundred forty thousand dollars with the Florida Panthers today. So they add some veteran uh, leadership to to their uh, lineup. Yeah, well, Brian Boyle was one of those guys that you know that was a really good character, really really good veteran. You know, the past few seasons in New Jersey, and. He was someone that, you know, on a personal level, you know, people who, you know, were beginning to fight cancer, um, he was someone that they looked up to and someone that fought off, you know, something that more internally scary. Yeah. And, you know, he's, you know, he, you always feel good for him when it's, when he scores a goal and, you know, Boyle, he's going to help those young players in Florida with, the their face offs he he did wonders for Zaka and T Shear while he was in New Jersey. And I wish him nothing but the best when he when he goes down to Florida. And you know, he's gonna have an emotional return when he comes to New Jersey when, when the Panthers play them again. Um if they come back, which I'm not sure. It all depends on how they work the schedule this year. But even when he plays them down in Florida it's gonna be emotional for him because he spent you know, he had some fun times with the Devils. And I'm just checking their schedule to see uh, when the Panthers do play the Devils. Um, hold on a sec. I'm scrolling because the Panthers currently, their schedule in October, they'll be at Nashville on the 19th and that, and then home versus Pittsburgh. Okay. And, you know, Brian, <clears throat> Brian Boyle had a good, uh, good uh, year last year against the Penguins for the Devils. And for a moment, I thought, you know, he would have loved to – have come back to New Jersey and signed for another year. Um, but however, kids like Bastion, you know, pretty tall kids can, you know, you can easily replace them, but the character uh, is going to be hard to replace. But you just, oh, by the way, uh, February 11th, uh, 7 p.m., Devils fans, uh, you'll be having a good chance of possibly seeing Brian Boyle return in a Devils uniform. That's a day after um uh, the Panthers play at the Flyers and after they play the Devils on the 11th, um, they'll be playing home against the Flyers in, uh, in Clearwater. So if any of you uh, Devils fans that live down in Florida, um, please peg your calendars for February 13th. All right. So there you go. February 13th, Boyle returns to New Jersey to play the Devils. So that'll be uh, that'll be a fun game. February thirteenth, they have the Flyers at home. Okay. Eleventh um, is uh, is they're playing at the Prudential Center. All right. So, so the, see the February... Devils fans in Devils fans in the Tri State area, please mark your calendars. Oh, that'll for be for seven good. p.m. Uh, February eleventh. February eleventh, so, it is. So people, three days before that is, I mean, three days after that is uh, Valentine's Day. So don't forget. Oh, yeah. To set, to send some love to Brian Boyle. Absolutely. Or your lady friend out there, because that's a very important day for them. <laughs> you may not care about it. They do. So make it right on Valentine's Ma- Day. Make it right or else uh, things won't be going tight. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You ain't getting no love on Valentine's Day if you screw up. But Valentine's Day is a long ways away. We're here in October. We're talking about Devils hockey. You know, two wins in the past two games is a good thing considering all the negativity around this team. People are talking about firing the coach. You know, Tom Fitzgerald right now has righted the ship, so that's a good thing. And there's hopefully, you know, the the first two games are a template of what uh, Heinz Kowalski, uh, you have Greer and Nazardin and Melanson need to use. Well, not so much Melanson because he's the goalie coach. Uh, goalie coaches are a little bit different. Uh, but the other several, you know, they need to uh, use that um, defensive-minded uh, uh, structure and take away those uh, ag- aggressive puck carriers on the opposing teams and start neutralizing them and start creating your own opportunities and – don't allow them to take up as much room as you used to give in the first six. Um, those are the things that kill you. But if you prevent the things that kill you, uh, you can certainly 
win a lot more battles and win more outcomes. Yeah. You got five days to work on things. Um, you're going to look at the tape. You're going to see what you did well. You're going to make sure you continue to do the things you do well. And then you're going to work on the things that you're not doing so well. And that, you know, they're going to have their little battles. And as the player said after yesterday, even with the time off, they're going to try to simulate game day feels, um, game day practices, uh, actual games. That way they're, they keep in, they're still ready to go once the Coyotes come into town on Friday night. And one of the things I, I was talking to someone the other day about Damon Severson, you know, not not being able to step up defensively. And I said, you know, he stinks in that one category, but his real best uh, attribute is being able to contribute as a offensive defenseman. That's what he's been known from his draft day. That's what he's been when he plays for played for uh, Hockey Canada. It's what he's been known as a devil. And he can play a little bit better defensively, don't get me wrong, but um, you know, for him, you know, being one of the big point getters over the years, um, he has to tweak a little bit in this upcoming week. Yeah, it, yeah, he's going to be working on things. You know, he was one of the guys that the Devil fans have been picking on. Has been David Seamerson in his play in the last two games. He's looked re- a lot better um, than he did in the first six. So. You know, he's going to work on things. The whole team is. I mean, you know, from power play, penalty kill, defensively. You know, goalies will be working on some things. The forwards are going to have to work on some things. They're going to have to get their line straight uh, come the Coyotes game. I mean, most likely they're just going to roll with the same lines because they've won two in a row and you don't want to change anything. Mm-hmm. It's like the old superstition, like uh, – or not the old superstition, the old saying. If it ain't broken – don't fix it. Right. With proper English, the, you don't have to change anything. <laughs> exactly. Like, they've won two games. They're probably going to keep the same lineup anyway. Um, the only thing is going to be is what um, condition Will Butcher is going to be in. If he has to go on IR. I mean, he's already on IR. How long he's going to have to stay on there. So, he hasn't been ruled out of the game for Friday yet because it's so far away and they have so much time off in between. So the Devils could be getting some players back uh, for the Coyotes. The $7 million man in Nico Heeshear and Will Butcher could be back as well. So they're going to have to make some lineup adjustments there. But that would probably be the only thing I see is Heeshear coming into the lineup. They may have to... May have to make a call up. May, maybe make a call up or send, or they could just keep Tennyson up, um, whatever they want to do. I actually like Tennyson. I mean, he's he's proven from the Ranger game. He's got two assists. He was able to play pretty good physically. He wasn't out of position much. Uh, I still think he's growing as a defenseman at the NHL level. And he, I think he could be a proven steal. Uh, Connor Carrick is another guy that you can stick in the lineup, you know, on the defense. And he can be a good two-way player. Yeah, and Tedison is making every uh, opportunity. He's taking every opportunity that has been given to him. He wants to prove he's an NHL defenseman, and through the games he's been here, I've seen nothing wrong with his game. I like what he brings to the table, and they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. Now, again, things could change if Butcher comes back. They're going to have to make a move here and there. So, I mean, I would hate to see a guy like that go have to go back down because he's done so well. So we'll see what they see what management decides to do there. And I think this is a very good uh, situation for Ray Shiro and Tommy Fitzgerald as uh, GM and assistant GM to make these big uh, decisions together because, you know, over the season, people forget that uh, Tom Fitzgerald was promoted to assistant GM and vice president, etc. But the step below uh, Ray Shiro. I mean, Lord forbid, you know, when Ray Shiro is gone, you know, you have Tommy Fitzgerald as the GM to succeed him. Then uh, you possibly have, you know, well, Paul Castron, the former director of amateur scouting, became the big uh, 
the big step up above the whole scouting uh, department. And uh, that's where Gates Orlando uh, took that position in being the director of amateur scouting uh, over the summer. Yeah, I mean, Tommy Fitzgerald's got a lot on his plate, too. Not only is he the assistant general manager of the Devils, but he also runs the Binghamton Devils as well. So he has a lot of traveling he has to be doing. Um, and he did that prior to um, the Ranger game. He he went down, uh, watched Binghamton play, and then he came back up to coach. So he's got he's got a lot of hats he's got to wear as well. And he and he was in Scranton Wilkes Bear the other night. And you know what? You know this isn't your typical hockey job. I mean, we as podcasters, you know, think about the time Amanda Stein. Uh, interviewed uh, Paul Castron during the Devils uh, All Access podcast. They, how many times had uh, had Castron gone, you know, to see amateur hockey games? He's he, he said over two hundred and eight, if not two hundred and forty. That's a lot of games. Think about how many tournaments. Like at least think about almost three a day. I mean, you go in and out and you see maybe a couple periods of a certain player, you know, or certain players that uh, your, your regional scouts and national scouts are high on and you want to double check their work. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's just a ton of hockey that you're just going to be going on. I mean, being a scout is such a tough job um, because you have to go to, you know, you're going to tournaments all over. You're, you're coming over to, um, you're going over to Europe you could be in Western Canada one day. You could be down in the AHL another day. You could be scouting the an AHL. You could be scouting, but I was going to say you're going to be scouting uh, NHL talent. See what trades you could bring in. Um, you know, so it's a lot of work being an NHL scout. Um, you know, these guys are just all over the place, and you know, kudos to them. And you know what? You know, we all take it for granted. You know. Everyone's looking at their uh, NHL app or their score.ca app, their uh, Twitter, social media of some sort, and they say, why did you send that guy down? Why did you trade for that guy? Why did you draft that guy, you know, et cetera? Um, There were, you know, tons of variables that, you know, we've been lucky to harvest over the past two uh, draft cycles that, We've seen um, Tommy Fitzgerald and Ray Shiro talk with, you know, publicly with other scouts on their staff on on TV for us with Amanda Stein. Yeah, and, you know, these guys do a great job. Um, you know, the other night there was like six, seven scouts watching the Devil game alone. They have their own seating in the press box. Um, so – it's that time of year, and not to mention now you got scouts from Seattle coming to watch uh, Devils games and other games around the league because they have a team to, to get together. Because for fans who uh, don't know what exactly we're talking about, um, in a positive light, this means uh, think of you have one less player. Um, you have to have a certain amount of skaters to goaltender ratio. Um, cap friendly explains it a little bit clearer, but – um, it's a certain number of forwards, defensemen, and goaltenders. Yeah. Um, so they got to get their team in order. I mean, they're still a long ways away before Seattle comes in the league, but they have to make preparations. So general manager Ron Francis is going to do his best to get everything in line. And and it's going to be – uh, you're eventually going to see one New Jersey double uh, taken, and that's going to be in the – 2021 draft mock draft expansion and so there's going to be similar uh, it's going to be the similar formula that they used for Vegas back in 2017 except Vegas is exempt from this draft which a lot of people even myself you know you know a little upset you know that they still have to do that they, they say well Vegas has been around just long enough they said no 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 just for a few seasons is not long enough for them to harvest. Right, exactly. And, you know, again, it just goes back to the theory that um, 
the NHL is doing everything in their power to make sure Vegas is uh, a good team and they don't have to go through a lot of the growing pains that other teams had to go through. It's kind of like a pioneering stage for the most part. I mean, uh, people talk about, you know, what would Seattle be like? I think Seattle will be pretty good. I mean, maybe not as good as Vegas in the first year, but I still – you know, I heard rumor uh, out there on Twitter uh, that they might be the Kraken, K R A C K E N, which is like, uh, like a like a sea monster. That would be cool. That would be a cool team name. Um, yeah, there. The, the thing is, general managers from around the league know what deals to make and what deals not to make because of what happened with. Vegas and losing good players that they actually didn't really want to lose. So I don't know if see, see, you know, Vegas set a standard of winning in their first season going all the way to the cup final. I don't see that with Seattle. Um, I think they'll fall into the Minnesota Columbus Nashville expansion team kind of cycle where they are going to have to go through some growing pains first. I think it will be nowhere near as bad as like the Kansas City Scouts or no, no. The, Co- the the Colorado uh, Rockies of the uh, late seventies, early eighties. Uh, not that bad, but I mean, l- I mean a few steps below Las Vegas level. Oh, that's that's, that, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I I agree. A few steps below Vegas. I mean, you know, like you said, there's always growing pains. You know, uh, Ranger fans will say stuff about the Devils being, oh, how, how do you like your expansion team? I said, you know what? They're the best expansion team ever. And then, you know what? We got three Stanley Cups. And how many have you had since 1994 a- after the fact that your team was a, a so-called original six? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Devils have done wonders as an expansion team. They're all coming into their own, which is great to see. Um, and the Devils, you know, things are going to get back to those glory days. It's just going to take time. Um, you just got to remain positive and just trust the process of them, you know, finding the right players and, and putting the right mix of players on the ice together. And, you know, we talk about, you know, the right mix of players. And, you know, what uh, Ray Shiro did say um, I damn I darn well put in the right group of players and you know i like the fact that when he was being interviewed um he used that kind of language and you know he takes it to heart and you know what uh he's been known to curse but he's also been known to state his reasons and the the and the exact criteria in building his team and he's been very fortunate to have joshua harris and david blitzer's uh, investments in and trust and this has been a really good thing for him to build it upon and you know what we talk so much about coaching that um, how long can this go on for you know uh, Fitzgerald uh, kind of babysitting the coaching staff uh, you never know when you're going to bring in a, a better uh, person to coach our New Jersey Devils yeah and you know Fitzgerald, they his has done well behind the bench. Um, you know Hines is there. You gotta wonder though, if with him on the bench, you gotta still wonder if they're looking behind the scenes at who the next guy could be. Maybe they bring in a, maybe they bring in an Oates or a Stevens, especially those two guys to help one help run a power play and two with defensive uh, zone coverage because both guys did well when they were here with the Devils. I honestly, you know, a lot of fans miss the physical side of Scott Stevens, but uh, when you watch NHL Network or just look at some of his work on uh, on YouTube, you know, Scotty really shows, like, with the hockey stick that how you break down a certain play, why this guy needs to be facing a certain angle and cutting off a different angle, you know. It makes sense, and even Bryce Salvador has a similar – mindset um i think scotty speaks of it more passionately and loudly um as a guy who works on uh nhl network yeah he just brings so much 
to the table. His analytical mind is great. The way he breaks down every play is great. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a shame that things um, didn't work out for him in Minnesota. He could still be, you know, coaching in the league. But the fact that we get to see his talent on NHL Network every night is unbelievable. It's a treat. And, you know, we talked about Adam Oates. And, you know, I really personally loved Adam Oates' power play uh, for that 2011-2012 New Jersey double season. Had, when we had guys like Peter Sikora who came back for another run, and you had Ilya Kovalchuk, you had Zach Parise, uh, David Clarkson. You know, these guys looked a lot clean, crisper. Uh, Adam Henrique, as a, y- as a young buck still, you know, uh, he made his uh, footprint as a, uh, as a power play coach uh, to be one of the most uh, pivotal in, in that Devils uh, coaching staff. And – that's one of the things I miss about um, Joff Ward, who's in Calgary. Yeah, and, I mean, that coaching staff was was really good when they had all those three guys on there. Um, you know, but now you've got Fitzgerald, Kowalski's there. They're all working together as one to make sure that the Devils continue their upward trajectory. Um, they're going to study the film. You know, it's having played the game and been around it for so long, it is nice to have those wins and it's tough. Those film sessions are tough after losses, but I never forget one of my coaches told me we looked at, you know, some tape after a win and he just kept pointing to everything that we did wrong. Um, even in a victory. So I was a little humbling. So I'm wondering if that's what the devil's coaching staff are going to be doing uh, tomorrow when they work on, when they get back to practicing. Yeah, you talk about that at the professional level. Also, like when you do that in a short span, like uh, with a with a lot of the young draft prospects, you know, like I watched Denmark play last year, uh, and Matt Sugard was the goaltender that I really wanted to see succeed uh, on the under 18s. Uh, his defense uh, let him down. They were too loose. They were all over the place. They were all uh, pressured by Switzerland, Sweden, Russia, and they were picked apart. But uh, when Denmark was knocked out, um, I saw the Cherry versus Orr tournament, and I really liked what I saw out, out of Mad Sugard in that, uh, that little showcase there. And in that small amount of time, I saw that he was very calm, cool, and collected. Uh, went around a bunch of guys, his skill set or better, and that made him uh, let up only less, only one goal in that little outing. And he just still looks like lights out. Yeah, and you know, seeing those guys playing those kind of tournaments and those showcases because the the uh, or cherry one is one of the biggest ones. Um, it's also televised on NHL Network. Um, you know, you see guys that you've watched internationally that come over, and you, you hope for them to do the best. And, yeah, you know, they may not look good at all times because they're playing on a team that doesn't, you know. They don't know each other very well. Exactly. And these short, like, World Junior tournaments or under-18 tournaments – Having kids play together that don't know each other is really tough. And, it, you you know, outside the top, you know, nations in the world, when Denmark gets called up or Germany or one of those teams, you know, you know, lately well, they've been playing better. But most of the time it's an easy couple of points for, like, the big teams out there. Yeah, and, you know, we looked at um, – what was it? You see how uh, in that – uh, cherry or tournament that's actually where i got uh, my eye on uh on constantino and i got my eye on uh, graham clark and graham clark was one of those guys that you know he didn't look his play didn't look sexy but you saw that he was out there to go score on like a power play or even like five on fives etc those kind of things those intangibles the will to uh 
go towards the net or being in mid danger, not always in high danger and try and create the most scoring chances when you can. And that's what the devils had their eye on and they picked him and they got him and um, sure he's injured now, but once he gets done with his, uh, with his injury, he he's going to be healthy and he's going to start clicking for the Ottawa 67s. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of good prospects out there for the Devils coming up. You know, a lot of great hockey going to be watched um, for them, especially, you know, especially now with the Devils not on TV. Go check out if you can stream, you know, six, find who your favorite prospect is. There's always games on online somewhere. Get the highlights on YouTube. Um, he's been, you know, or go find, you know, Riley Walsh playing NCAA hockey. Go out and watch the prospects and see what they're doing and see what's in the pipeline. And, hey, get over to Binghamton for a game. Go watch some AHL hockey. You got to see what's and, in the pot. And you got to see what's in the pipeline. And for those of you who are starting to learn uh, advanced stats and, uh, and draft uh, prospects in a more analytical way in numbers – uh, Will Scouch of Scouching, who I personally watch myself. Um, you can also follow him on Patreon. He does an amazing job of keeping track of these players. Um, I do, matter of fact, um, I kind of disagree with him on Daniel Misul. Uh, the Devils need a guy who's a physical defenseman who has speed like a Niedermeyer and can take care of his own end but play physically. Um, in that sense of being a two-way uh, defender. I mean, you see these kids in Russia, uh, it's not always easy getting them over, but uh, when they play out their contract and they're, and your regional scouts and your uh, assistant GMs able to communicate knowing that they're committed in the, in the nearer term, once that contract ends, you get them over. Oh, yeah, you have to get them over. And then there's, there's a Russian right now. That the uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the uh, Montreal Canadiens are going after uh, Kirill Kaprizov. Yep, they're going after him. Uh, he's one of the top uh, Russians in the league. Uh, coming that they want to get. Other teams are wondering if it, it's even worth it to um, contact his agent and his camp because the Canadians and uh, Maple Leafs want him so badly. You know, we talk about, like, back in the Lou era, you know, after Ilya Kovalchuk went back, a lot of Devils fans soured on Russians, but with the Shiro uh, era right now, with the way that we have these regional scouts and uh, we have Tommy Fitzgerald around, you see how important and integral it is that um, they redevelop the New Jersey Devils relationship with Russia uh, in that sense of d- their drafting and uh, harvesting players. Yeah, and cons- considering that the Devils were one of the first teams to bring over Russian talent uh, during the Lou era um, and the Dr. John McMullen era, um, it's nice to see that they haven't soured on that talent because there's a really a lot of good talent in Russia. Um, you know, a lot of people are weary. A lot of teams are weary, especially about drafting them because you're not sure what they're going to do. Are they going to stay in the KHL? Are they going to stay? Are they going to come over and then go back like Radulov situation? But the fact that the KHL could be contracting teams next year, a lot of top Russians are going to be on the market. I mean, you know, Vasily Podgols and dropped to, I believe, the Vancouver Canucks, if I'm correct in the That's draft. That's correct. And they have a really good forward, a really good power forward with a lot of speed and physical play. He's going to be that guy that, you know, will take the pressure off uh, Ilya Elias Pettersson uh, in the long term. And, you know, it gives the Canucks uh, an idea of what to play with. And, you know, coming from a double standpoint, you know, you see the next couple drafts, they're – Pretty stacked, you know. Last year was the the year of the center. Um, you know, this year, you know, you're supposed to have a little bit more in defense. Uh, that's what we hope for. But sometimes this is where your, actually, this is where your your big scouts get their big paychecks is finding the guys in the later rounds that weren't projected to be as good. 
And the Devils have been doing that and finding steals in the mid late rounds. Exactly. The scouts are, you you know, everybody talks about your their, your first round draft pick. Well, guess what? Your team is built on rounds two through seven. That's where you can find those guys that can play in the National Hockey League. I mean, first round guys could always play, but. You know, the fact that Detroit found a guy like Pavel Datsuk in the sixth round. I mean, that's just unbelievable. And we also talk about these, you know, players from the smaller countries like Switzerland. And Switzerland is a hockey immersion country, like uh, like Denmark in a bit. You know, you have Matt Sugard. Uh, you have a couple other players from Denmark who've, proven over the years to be really good uh, in that league. And you have Finland, which is a total powerhouse on a totally different level, totally different skill set. And uh, you've seen these smaller population countries, uh, Slovenia being one of them. And they're starting to grow their players and their programs. And even at times, you look at the IHF, you know, Colombia got in – C O L O M B I A, Colombia, the country, got in, instated into the IIHF. It's it's nice to see more teams getting into the double IHF. Um, Slovenia, you know, Anze Kopitar, um, he's you know he's made that country proud. You know, Slovakia's got great talent. You know, like you said, Switzerland, and obviously you have the powerhouses and the Czechs and the Russians, the United States, Canada, Sweden, Finland. Um, so there's just so much talent around the world. There's only so many roster spots for every player, but that's why you have good scouts. That's why you need good scouts because that's where they can be because guys like you and me can't be watching a million games every day. (laughs) It it, would be mind boggling. You know, we'd have to write so many notes ourselves. And once we see these players, we start grading them on our own levels. As a matter of fact, um, for our listeners, you know, I have, you know, different variables and what I see, like I'll watch one tournament, like for instance, Jim talked about um, the Russian versus uh, CHL uh, conferences. You know, that's one that we can look at. Um, the other one I look at are the YouTube highlight reels. And I look at the build of the player, um, how well do they skate? Um, how is their vision? Uh, like, for instance, we talk about are, are, are they good at uh, their hockey sense as well? You know, getting into certain areas, um, you know, that most people don't go to and the ones that really, you know, when the puck is loose or you get open and you create that opportunity to score or defend. Yeah, yeah. Um... There's so there's so much hockey out there. Um, do yourselves a favor and, and, and watch as much as you can. Uh, it, it's just there's so much great talent out there. I'm keeping my eye on on those tournaments. I usually keep my eye on the big tournaments out there: World Juniors, you under 18s, um, you know, World men's, Fan, men's Worlds, um, and then obviously Ivan uh, the Helenka Gretzky tournament's always fun to watch. So there's just some some great hockey out there. Um, you get to see some great young talent that you may see in the National Hockey League in a few years. And of course, we also recommend you know listeners uh, when you uh, learn about um, other NHL players that you like um, that should be on a te- on a team that you want to be like the Devils or you see prospects in another team's farm system or another team outside of the NHL, et cetera, um, you know, you're more than welcome to uh, send us ideas of who would you like to see, you know, make a list. Um, we'll break it down. We'll put it on an, on a podcast uh, and make it devil's worthy. And, uh, you know, we like to work with things for fun and also give our perspectives. I mean, we watch a lot of devil's hockey, but also we watch, Other teams' highlights, for instance, you know, I mentioned and we mentioned uh, the Vancouver versus Ranger game. And, you know, we see kids like Brendan Lemieux who are uh, coming from the different kind of stock like uh, Claude Lemieux and, 
you see, you know, Jack and Quinn Hughes come from their mom and dad's side, which all have, you know, some sort of pedigree of hockey. And, you know, um, this is, it's in their blood. It's basically there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I watched, uh, I was just watching Chicago, Washington tonight and, and Kirby Doc was made his NHL debut tonight for the Chicago Blackhawks. He was going up against Washington. Then I was watching McDavid and Drysaddle do battle against the Canucks uh, uh, for for the Oilers against the Jets, which was you know fun, another fun game to watch. I I, I I really like Kirby Dodd. He's a really good uh, center winger, and he's a big body, and he likes to get gritty along the boards, and he's got a good long arm span. And you know the Blackhawks need a guy like that. Uh, to start taking over the reins in the top six and the third line for the Blackhawks because you can't rely on um, Jonathan Taves for so very long. You need someone to start stepping up. Yeah, and the fact that the the, the uh, Blackhawks are moving in the young direction, you got uh, Alex Nylander in there, Alex DeBrinkett, um, and now adding Kirby Doc to the mix, it's just me. It's just gonna see that you're seeing their your fu- the future right before your eyes because Kane and Taves are gonna be gone soon. Um, Seabrook's gonna be gone. Keith's gonna be gone. So they're starting to move towards the younger players. And you know, you know, Kirby Doc's a great pick uh, that the Blackhawks had this past draft. So I wouldn't be surprised to see more guys from this the 2019 draft enter the league this season. To segue over back to Colorado, you know, we talked about Kale McCarr. He played for UMass Amherst uh, in my native state of Massachusetts, and I used to go to UMass games, and Jonathan Quick was a goaltender there when he was a freshman when I saw him. And I didn't know who he was at the time, but, you know, you see that after a freshman year, you know, a goaltender grows a lot better when they get more familiar in their second year, because the first year that they get is typically their development year at that level. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as we talked about throughout the program, it doesn't matter if you're playing in A or, or you're playing junior or you're playing in college. Having the years of development helps to transition to the National Hockey League a lot easier. And you could definitely see it with guys who've played at least one year of college hockey that the, it makes life so much easier when you play when you're playing at the pro level. And also um, sticking with Colorado on this one, um, one of my favorite uh, players from the recent 2019 draft. You know, I really liked uh, Bowen Byram. You know, he was a guy. If the Devils didn't get in the top three, um, he would be a guy I would pick. Or if they did get, you know, the third spot, he would be. He would be that one guy I would I would actually consider drafting that soon because, you know, he's tall, physical. He can play a defensive game, and he has a really good uh, way of managing the puck, and he's got a good arm span. And he may not be Zdeno Chara, but you know, he's this era's you know version of a big burly defenseman. I mean, that was a steal at four for Colorado to get Bo and Byram there. Um, this is why Ottawa should have mortgaged their future. Yeah, exactly. Because then they could have had another stud defenseman or they could have had Jack Hughes or whoever. But, um, you know, Colorado's just loaded with talent. I mean, up front alone, you know, you got Ranton and McKinnon and Landis Gog on the back end. McCarr's back there. And now Bowen Byram's in the system. Uh, they are just They are just playing really well. Great hockey right now. They're young. They have such a young team. It's they're only going to get better as time goes on. And to have a kid like Byron in the pipeline, it's it's just a luxury that Joe Sackick is was afforded to thanks to his trade of Matt Duchesne. And then you also have, um, you know, that, there was that stupid rumor about Elliot Freeman talking about uh, Taylor Hall possibly going to. Freaking Edmonton, which I know I'm supposed to make this more positive, but uh, one of my most positive ideas of a prospect, if we got a defenseman in a return, if the worst case scenario ever happened, uh, I, I'm i not crazy about Evan Bouchard. 
I'm sorry, but the Devils have enough uh, offensive defensemen as it is. But uh, Philip Broberg, hello, yeah. yeah. I like a nice two-way physical uh, presence, especially a Swede. Uh, do, I really don't care about the nationality part. I care about the, the quality of the player and the style that they play. And he plays a really good NHL-style game. And I think he could have rivaled um, – Bowen Byron for that spot. Yeah, um, that would have been – that's a great pick to get. Again, you know, the fact that Edmonton wants Hall, um, yeah, if I was Edmonton, I wouldn't trade the bank for him because there's no guarantee that he's going to resign. I would just wait to free agency before I, I, give, I just give him an offer then. And then maybe – and then the Devils could trade other players to Edmonton for Bouchard. Um, so – I, I like I said, I don't think Edmonton and the Hall is gonna fit as a trade. I can see it more if he's signed in the off season. And then we talked about, you know, putting the brakes on things like that. Yeah, for the time being, it, things are slowing down because the team is starting to pick up traction in the win column. And as long as the Devils find the right coaching staff to uh utilize this more uh John Tortorella style, you know, shot blocking, sticks in the lanes, you know, frustrate the other team, you know. It would be great to have another coach implement that style of defensive hockey. I mean, sure, we're not going to play the trap all the time, but or or at all, it would be great to see another coach. I mean, whether it's uh, Adam Oates or Scott Stevens, maybe Guy Boucher, as a as a nice little patchwork, yeah, um, they got to just get better in their own zone. They, I mean, they've cleaned up a lot of things in the past two games, getting sticks in the lane. But you also got to get sticks out of the lane so you let your goaltender see the puck. So and and you and you're gonna say I was gonna just say yeah, that's the one thing like Don Cherry's harped upon is about you know just making sure your goalie sees everything. Not try to don't screen your own goaltender either. I see a lot of time when players go down block shots, but then, then the goalie can't see where the shot's coming from. Just yeah, you want to block a shot, great, but don't create layers in front of your own goalie where he can't see it. You know this old saying goes: you're better off don't be a door than a window, because at least when you have a window, you can see through it. But when you have a door, it can always be closed and open. Exactly, exactly. Um, but it is getting to be that time where where we start to crank it down a little bit. We hit the an hour forty minutes tonight, folks, and this is going to be pretty interesting. Send us in your ideas because the Arizona Coyotes are coming. The Devils are winning. Woo! Woo! I mean, the Devils are winning. Two in a row. Let's try to carry the momentum against Arizona. I know I have some friends that are Coyotes fans um, out on the West Coast. So I know I'm going to be hearing it from them. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a great week. Um, There's another great episode of the podcast. Send us our ideas, questions, comments, concerns, whatever prospects you want to talk about. We'll, We'll try to get our best to do to get everything in. And it was a jam packed night post two wins so if we can do more of these going forward and we can hear a little hey ho hey hey, hip hop hooray because we've been howling all night long to gaslight anthem it is time to wrap this puppy up let's go devils let's go devils baby let's go baby let's go let's go all right peace out devils fans peace out have a great night The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.